Mohit and the Sun, Book 9. The Bright and Hungry Future of Hawks. By John Wilcher. Deleted Scene. Squeezy wasn't entirely happy about the advice he'd just given Ben. It was partially true. All lies he knew were best peppered liberally with the truth. But he'd given Ben the easy version of Alexei. Nicholas 101, perhaps. It amazed him still that after a decade together, Ben could still not see the reality of the man he loved. But love, Squeezy suspected, was the problem. Ben was so in love he tried to bend the universe to how he wanted it to be. How he wanted his Nicholas to be. When Squeezy had first met Nicholas, he'd only been vaguely interested in the tall, particularly handsome, obviously extremely wealthy guy from some place that was in England. He was intrigued that his old mate Ben Ryder was having sex with him, however. That was a turn-up for the books. When Nicholas broke Squeezy's arm, outside of the burning horse tour manor, his focus upon the man had become a little sharper. Nicholas, to put it mildly, became a bit of an obsession. It took a lot of power to break a man's arm, obviously. One, incidentally, on a man who was purportedly your friend and helping you. But more importantly, to Squeezy's way of thinking, it took rare and almost unique savagery to do so. So that had been the moment when he'd zeroed in on Nicholas Mickelson and begun his fascinating new hobby. For it had occurred to Squeezy when being plastered and x-rayed and generally prodded and probed that he may have finally found someone in the world who was similar to him. It was a startling thought, for he'd gotten to the age of thirty and concluded he would just have to accept that he was a bit of a one-off. Being unique was okay, but it was lonely too. And so his study had begun. He had plenty of opportunity for observation because he was entirely invisible himself. He made himself so. And that was the first thing he had learned about the blond man. Nicholas also was entirely unseen by the rest of the world. Family chatter went on around him. Nicholas was sitting quietly. He obviously talked more to Ben than he did to anyone else, but even with Ben, Nicholas was mostly silent. And yet behind that silence, the life being lived was deep and evocative, and Squeezy could hear it. He could have told the man, therefore, that his method of camouflage was better. After all, if you were constantly making a useless babble of noise, no one had the time or patience to look deeper. But he guessed the quiet man's strategy had been developed, as had his, as a very young child, and had then been honed over life's challenges. So he was now unable to change. Nicholas had obviously adapted his tactics a little when he'd met Ben and had consequently been dragged into Ben's more normal world of friends and family. Because, as Squeezy had already noted, he did then have to actually speak. And it appeared Nicholas usually adopted the same technique as he did, to obfuscate and confuse. What he said was mostly utter bullshit. Squeezy had been impressed, however, how well the inner man had still hidden himself from him. Over the years, Nicholas had clearly realised that his act didn't work as well with him as it did with other people, but he'd merely switched tactics seamlessly and had appeared to let Squeezy into the inner circle of people he trusted. Nicholas with his dark past, and Squeezy now aware of this and being part of the team. Most people fell for it. It had only been when Ben had left Nicholas to shack up with God that Squeezy's intense and fascinating new hobby had come to fruition. When he'd met Alexei, for the first time. Obviously, he knew that Nicholas wasn't the man's name. He already knew his real name was Alexei. But names were semantics. He wasn't Squeezy. He wasn't Michael Heathcote, come to that. But in the glass house, united in the single-minded aim to get Benjamin Ryder back, he had finally been introduced to the actual man, Alexei. To the world, however, they were wassock and moron, which suited them both just fine. So now that Squeezy had found Alexei, he wasn't about to lose him. But Alexei, he knew, had one fatal flaw. The rest of the world might see this defect the exact opposite way around, as the man's one saving grace. But again, semantics. Alexei needed Ben Ryder to love him. So what Squeezy had told Ben was a partial truth. There was a high place, and a man was up there, being kept away from all the darkness, but it was Alexei holding Ben up, and always had been. Alexei needed a safe place, and he needed Ben up in the bright sun, flying free, being his safety, 
pulling him constantly toward the light. But if this analogy was anywhere near the truth of how Alexei genuinely saw his relationship with Ben, then it all depended upon Ben not looking down any time soon. Although Ben claimed there was nothing Nicholas could ever do that would stop him loving him, as Alexei had pointed out to Squeezy one day when they were enjoying some less than healthy fun which was not being enjoyed in the gym, that was Nicholas. Alexei wasn't Nicholas. And there were many things Alexei had done and might still do that would definitely put that love under some considerable strain. But the stories Alexei had told Squeezy about his life had not included this latest intriguing confession. This little gem, Squeezy noted with fascinated glee, had been kept out of the fun. Squeezy could see that this might be difficult for Ben to overlook, as he overlooked the other general murder and mayhem that was Alexei's contribution to the world. This might well prove then that there was one thing Nicholas could do that would indeed stop Ben loving him. If Ben looked down into the roiling mass beneath his perfect world and withdrew his love, then there was very little point Alexei shoring it up anymore. He'd probably just let it tumble down and walk away. Squeezy wasn't too sure whether he wanted to be there to prevent that happening or make sure he was ready to accompany the departure. And that confusion kept him at the window of the caravan, staring out over the gradually revealed view of the moors under the cold winter dawnlight.